I think one of the best things about organising your own conferences that you get to invite people to speak that you want to speak. And Carsten is one of the, the people that I've been very much inspired by in my, my career. Um, I've known Carsten only for a, a couple of years or so. Uh, I s first came across his work at an art gallery uh, in London called The Barbican, where he had put a, an incredible project together where he had written in closure script code to generate and drive a 3D printer and use that 3D printer to generate an enclosure and then created a wonderful universal interface for children to, to use and to, to drive a 3D printer. And it was absolutely a stunning piece of work. Um, if you want to read more about that, I, I did blog about it. Um, Carsten said, make his introduction quick, so I'm going to hand right over to, to Carsten. Um, and uh, uh, thanks very much for, for coming. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you all for coming and thank you to the Chucks crew for inviting me. It's a big honor to be part of that first round of hopefully many. Um, so I've got a lot of material and there will be some live coding as promised in the program but not the whole session um, because I also feel in half an hour you can only do that much and I think there's more um, benefit for you all if there's a bit of context behind some of the stuff I've been doing and why I'm doing certain things. So like the, uh, everything goes under that overall frame like low-fat computing, I will get back to that later, but just a bit of background, like I've been running my own design practice since 2007, mainly dealing with those things um, computational design is really for me the idea of taking design and stop considering it a noun, a thing, and actually turn it really, treat it as a verb, as a process, so very much like functional programming, uh, dissolving things into their actual actions, and been lucky enough to do this for quite a few number of uh, clients. So my work is often on the boundary between commercial and like more art oriented and everything is pretty much research driven. So I spent probably more than half of my time just doing basically unpaid stuff and trying to develop things which then inform other projects and commissions. So part of that is also uh, teaching in universities and also in my kitchen. <laughs> Markham has been there, he can attest to it. Um, so this is all really kind of the, the idea of this whole like post-spectacular approach. So the term post-spectacular is actually from a book by Guy Debord from the 19th or in the 60s. And he, in that book he talks about a society where people stop treating the spectacle like as the main thing in our society and actually spend their time more proactive, like actually improving society. And for me, open source is one of the most clearest expressions of that idea. And that wasn't really planned. I just, the way I started using computers, it happened automatically, but I've been basically a strong open source proponent since the beginning. And my beginnings, I will get to very quickly as well. Just very quickly some uh, guiding quotes as well. And for me, this is really the most important quote in my life so far, the Wittgenstein. And here language, I don't talk about closure <laughs> or other programming language. With language, I simply mean the fundamental skill of humans that we can turn things into languages. And we can only actually think of new things if we actually have uh, identified words for them. So if you never uh, looked into the language of cooking or photography and then you can't mix them up <laughs> as a really silly example. Um, I'm from East Germany, so this is what I learned quite early on. Maybe more so than people who grew up in like more richer countries in the West. Um, but my very first computer wasn't the Atari. It was actually an East German machine, but Atari was really for me like the most formative um, experience early on with computers. And just to also give you an idea about, oops, why is this not playing? There we go. 
So here you can see some uh, records which are now yeah, from 88. You can do the maths yourself. 27 years, yeah, something like that. No, 29. Um, I can't do maths. <laughs> um, 28. So this is basically how I started. And those first few pages, I can't unfortunately scroll back here. But those first few pages were really just like how I started programming for the first year. We had one hour computer time a week and everything else had to happen on paper. So by doing this, you actually really are forced to do as much as you can where you pretend you are the machine. Because in that one hour time you have, you, you basically one mistake and the hour is gone and not just the hours, the whole week you lost. So it's really important that you actually step through and learn programming in your head and actually can debug a lot of those things in your head by simply making small steps and making um, like kind of a test-driven philosophy. <laughs> um, oh, here I need to replug quickly, sorry. <laughs> So even though these were super limited machines, yeah, the Atari 8-bit was a 1.79 megahertz machine. So it is about yeah, more than a thousand times slower than this laptop here. So in, even in modern terms, they were super limited, but even back then they were quite limited. But we still try to do cool stuff. So on this thing here, I did all the ba everything basically, from writing the chip tunes to the, I mean, the music is not mine. It's obviously Baker Street. For those who are old enough. Um, but um, so these were the first time I managed to do 3D graphics at interactive frame rates. Um, so, but for me. Like the whole idea, and really this has been following me no matter what platform or what language I've been using, like this idea from going from nothing to big things. So the same thing as you have in ge geometry where you say, okay, you have points, and points have no dimension, no size, but if you imaginary line up those points, you get a line, so you are in a one-dimensional setup. If you take those lines and line them up, you get a plane. Now you are in 2D, and if you take planes, you line them up, you, or stack them up, you get a three-dimensional space, and you can follow that on and on and on. Obviously, when you go beyond 3D, then you have philosophical issues and imaginary issues, like how do you, what is a 5D space? But you can also think about this as search spaces. So if you have a design, for instance, in this case here, we have um, a single random point moving hundreds of thousands of times through space randomly and recording every position. So it is basically a random point cloud we have here. It's just nicely rendered out. And when you start taking that randomness and actually start constraining it and kind of have a predefined curve, you can get kind of a mixture between those two approaches, like you still are random, but you also kind of guide that randomness. So you can grow more like coral structures. And once you have those kind of structures, so here, for instance, we have Bezier curves, like you might know from Illustrator or other design tools, but they are in, not in 2D, they are in 3D. So it's, again, this idea you learn when you do programming that you abstract those ideas and generalize them, not just to that one setup, a commercial tool gives you, but actually that the same ideas exist in, in all sorts of spaces. And once you have that step that you can align them to curves, then you can actually form typography and get a TV, a TV um, commission to do an intro sequence for Channel 4. So I don't know who remembers that. That was a gardening program in 2008. And that 10-second intro took two weeks to render. So. But if you uh, zoom in, you can really see that last frame is over 200 million particles. Yeah, and this is like a, a close-up from an earlier stage in the animation. So everything is just really made out of points. And um, so a lot of those things we are done with my own software. So for the, since t beginning of 2000, I've basically only worked primarily with um, homebrew stuff like not homebrew the OS X project, but like homemade code. 
Um, and this is a map actually of that uh, main project I used with this toxic lips, which was just mentioned. So these are, there are about 320 building blocks written in Java, so basically classes, and then they were used for anything from doing uh, TV adverts here for Audi, that was together with Universal Everything. Interactive installations, this is in the Milan Design Museum, uh, speaker launch for uh, Kev and Ross Lovegrove, who designed those speakers, and this was done when I was working at Moving Brands. So that's a six meter long LED floor, and it's sound responsive to the music. Or you can create marker systems for identifying physical objects using computer vision, and the layout of those identifiers, so this basically the editor screenshot, this is what comes out, kind of teddy bears. But those uh, uh, symbols you can attach to physical objects, here, for instance, like business cards, and then use them in interactive installations or exhibitions to actually identify, in this case, real students. So this is at the London College of Fashion. It was also done when I was working at Moving Brands. Um, another idea of a similar project is this one here, which was for Google Web Lab at the Science Museum. So here we had over 750,000 uh, different tags, and the symbols in the center are actually really just a representation of that dot pattern around, and they were used to identify every visitor online and offline of the exhibition. So this was to, done together with TelArt, Be Real, and uh, Universal Design Studio. Uh, another example, and I'm really just showing you the, the, the scope of work when you think uh, generative design is often mainly screen-based, but I've been trying for a long time to really not just work with screens, although this might be called a screen as well. This was with Jason Bruce Studio at the Sunderland train station. This is the UK's longest LED wall, which is around 144 meters um, of glass bricks. And there are virtual characters like shadows of characters um, walking on that platform on the other side, and there are sensors on the train tracks which respond um, and trigger changes in the animation. And I don't really have now time to go into that. Um, another example is, and we will get back to that later as well, this idea of emergent behaviors. So what you see here is the by now quite famous reaction diffusion simulation, and it's its technical term is called the Gray-Scott reaction diffusion. And as you can see, there are different patterns emerging. And the interesting thing is that there is no macro design here. Those patterns emerge automatically through a simple process of diffusion where each pixel only looks at its four neighbors, nothing else. And by using, uh, there are only two different parameters here at play or if you are really strict, you can say there are four. But um, by simply changing those two numbers primarily, you can create a whole range of patterns you also find on a lot of animal skins, from tropical fish to mammals and so on. Um, if you take those, and this is going back now to what I described earlier, going from 0D to 3D or higher D, here we, we basically stack up the different frames of the animation to actually extrude a 3D model. And if you would seed that animation with an outline of a type, of a world, you would then be able to actually visualize this entire creation process in 3D as a static sculpture. You can get it 3D printed. That's the successful attempt. And then that was the cover design for print magazine in 2008. Another 3D print project here, again, completely generative, apart from some basic uh, com commonalities between those different characters is that they all have hip bones, they have knees, and they have the same feet. But everything else was customizable and also randomizable, and there's a physics simulation to actually very quickly reject characters which would not be able to stand up 
because when you do stuff on screen, this would be fine, but if you 3D printed, that thing might just fall over. So as a very quick um, uh, filter, you can basically do something which simulates the real world. So these are actually 3D printed, they are not rendered. There were about 100 of them. Um, this is another project with Universal Everything in 2008 or 9, don't remember, 8, I think, uh, for the VNA. And the VNA actually turned out in the long run for those, for about three, four years, to be the main sponsor of that Toxic Clips project, really, through, indirectly through commissions. Um, this was one of them. Another one was doing the identity for their decode exhibition, which was the first time digital art has been shown in the VNA. There was absolute uh, landmark exhibition. So the entire identity was done in processing as an open source software, which people could download and um, remix. And this was a, a kind of video mapping canvas uh, installation as part of their aestheticism exhibition in 2011. Um, so there's a lot of stuff just to give you really the idea of, of, of scope. And everything you've seen so far was largely done in, in Java and with that addition of the processing wrapper in a lot of those projects. But I, over the years, I really felt I need to slowly uh, go back and cover a higher number of uh, platforms. I have been really interested in those kind of devices for a long time. And uh, Clojure and Processing and Java, they are all not really usable for that. I mean, yes, there are attempts to get them to run on those kind of platforms, but <laughs> they are more or less like, yes, you can if you really, really want to, but <laughs> um, they are really not meant for that kind of stuff. So. Uh, the new project is really to kind of offer a set of tools which kind of spans that tower vertically from really low level to really high level. And um, there are now over 20 projects already. So I will only have time here to talk about a few of them. And one of them is what Marco mentioned earlier, the uh, commission by Barbican and, uh, and Google to do this installation as part of the Digital Revolutions exhibition. So this is three, three and a half meter printed 3D structure consisting of over 400, uh, the exact number is 468, I think, modules. Uh, they are all cable tied to each other. The entire structure is super lightweight, only weights about 13 kilos. It's lighter than that uh, metal truss on which everything hangs. And in the center here you can see there's a 3D printer which is um, looking initially like this and then it needs to be built up. And so this was an open source uh, 3D printer from Cyprus called Ilios HD. And it is basically using a resin-based approach and a modified or hacked video projector, which only emits a black and white image, and then you can slowly crystallize um, a, a layer within the resin and lift out a solid object. So there are a lot of Raspberry Pis used for this exhibition, had to be soldered up then, like those displays we are used to credit people who designed objects. Um, and this here is some pre-renders of that structure. So what's important here is that all those designs are done with a language which looks like this. So it's a visual programming language which only consists of eight different operators or eight different words. I will get back to them. And then this is what you basically can do in the browser to uh, visually program objects. And Part of the website is also this kind of GitHub style gallery where you can see how different objects relate to each other. So the idea of branching is really like taken here forward as well. And here are some example objects what people were doing. A lot of animals and um, quite simple objects, but this was really the idea. How, how uh, fast trip back can you create a design system?
So the underlying technology, or let's call it technology, <laughs> language uh, is this Morphogen project of mine. And here you can see those eight different um, operators. So you can split a shape, you can inset the color corners, you can mirror a shape, you can scale it, you can pull it, you can tilt it, or you can um, split it and indent together as an operation which creates a different effect than this one here. And the most important one of all really is the delete operation, because without that you could never create a, a complex shape really. So with those few things, and actually only using one word in this case here, using the reflection, you can actually start with one single segment, say a line here, and by re, uh, reflecting it over and over in different directions, you can basically create this infinitely expanding grid. But if you change the seed shape to something slightly different, then suddenly that same grid curves up into a ball without doing any code change, simply changing the seed of that entire um, design process. And because everything is kind of uh, hierarchical, we will see this in a minute, we can then also transplant objects or sub-objects from other designs into an existing design and this whole process can actually be um, automated using, for instance, genetic programming and then you can literally breed random objects and kind of evaluate them for fitness. So it's a really nice system and here you can see how that entire growth, for instance, happens over time. So you start really from a single segment and then we basically uh, descend further and further down into that hierarchical DNA structure. Um, here are some other examples. So a lot of those objects are really we are just done for testing what is the kind of aesthetic range of that entire setup. So don't ask me what this is supposed to be. <laughs> um, a lot of those things we are mainly testing like symmetries and like other things. If the, the nice thing is that every single object automatically is 3D printable in that process because everything always creates watertight uh, geometries. And here you can visual, like if you visualize that last object's DNA, then you can see this is how the tree structure looks. Here's another example. It's kind of inspired by the rose of Yariko, the desert plant which can live without water for 10 years and then you put it in a bowl of water and it unfolds. It looks at some point like this. Uh, so here the tree structure looks completely different. So this idea of uh, what I just described, randomly growing uh, basically programs, uh, is taken further here in another project where I used literally genetic programming to evolve that logo here. And this is basically a thousand, uh, after a thousand generations, it managed to find a program which would trace out that holo um, strand. But you can see there's a timeline here, the lower parts of that visualization are the earlier generations and it's complete spaghetti. So there's uh, not much really success rate. Um, you can take an idea called sign distance functions or sign distance fields and where you for every point in space evaluate a mathematical formula, i.e. a program, and you check if that value is positive or negative. If it's zero or smaller then you are inside a shape, if you are positive then you are still outside. So you can basically randomly create those kind of definitions of a field and then you can evaluate it for every point in space and you get those kind of tissue looking organic samples. So and you can layer this have with different configurations per layer and you get uh, ever different uh, geometries. So that is really like kind of the foreplay. Um, I don't know how much time I've left. <laughs> Two minutes? <laughs> um, how much do I have? Ten? Yeah? Okay. So for something completely different now, but not really because it's all related. Um, who knows who this dude is? 
Um, he's called Charles Moore, and who has ever heard of Charles Moore? Hey, five people, tops. <laughs> um, he's the inventor of a language called Forf. Who has ever heard of Forf? <laughs> ah, certainly. <laughs> um, who has ever used Forf? <laughs> okay, for how long? <laughs> <laughs> More than a week? Um, so basically, fourth is one of those kind of most hated and equally most fascinating languages ever invented because actually it has no language almost at all. So as you, unlike any other language, programming language you know, there literally is almost no syntax. And you can completely make up the syntax. The only thing you need to follow are some basic rules and you have to understand the idea of a stack. So I cannot do a fourth tutorial here, but I will do some live coding with fourth. And if you are online, you can follow along, but you have to use a different URL than what I'm using. So if, if you have a laptop, you can go to fourth.thing. I will zoom in so you can see that. So if you go to this URL, um, you can follow along or play around at home. So. I'm using a local version here, so it should look something like this. So this is a basic implementation of fourth in JavaScript, so it's an, an actual virtual machine. But I also have written um, support libraries for web audio and for WebGL. So, but just before uh, we do a little bit in there, let's give you an idea of what fourth looks like. So this is, for instance, a fourth program. So what do you think that does? It's one plus two. So unlike Lisp or Clojure, where everything comes in the front, yeah, this would be the thing in Clojure. In four, we actually always have data first. So that's actually a very interesting approach. Not actions first, data first. And then processes which operate on data. I really like that because it's actually very much like I work uh, with, with, even if I work with Clojure. So what this does, if we just type in one, two, you can see here we have this idea of a stack. So we now have one and two in this order on the stack. If I put a plus now on the stack, I won't really see that on the stack because the moment I place this plus on the stack, the plus will take two items from the stack, calculate their sum, and put the result back on. So we have now a three on the stack. Yeah, here you can see, is that big enough? I'm sorry, with the font size. Um, so if I want to print out that three, now I just type in dot, and then I get the three here in my REPL as an output. So the whole thing would be one, two, plus, dot, and you can do this. If I want to do something like a fused multiply add, like where you take three numbers and you want to, for instance, multiply the first or the last two ones and then add the very first one, then that would look like this. Yeah, so it's five times 10 plus three. So that gives you that. Um, just very quickly to define the same thing as a word, we can just call this here multiply add. And that's basically the composition of multiply and add. You see, there are no parameters or anything. It's simply the action on itself, completely like in, um, uh, what's the functional term? Curried, fully curried. <laughs> so now if I do, do the same thing, 3, 5, 10, and mat, uh, I have here 53 on the stack. I need to print it out. OK. Is that? Uh, good enough for a crash course. <laughs> so the fourth goes a lot further, but what I want to really do here is to load a demo I've prepared. So here my REPL has autocomplete as well. You can just type in like in and then tap. And so now we load here a bunch of things. And at the end, it basically creates a canvas and initializes a WebGL context. And then we can write pixel shaders in fourth. So a very simple pixel shader basically uh, looks like this. Is this big enough? Um, so the double semicolon ends the GLSL 
part. So GLSL, for those who don't know, it's the language used to write uh, code for the GPU. So basically our shader is a single character, <laughs> yeah, the X, and the X here refers to the X coordinate within the canvas. So that's basically a single value which will be placed on the stack and that becomes the final output. So if we only have one value, it's a grayscale. If I put X and Y on, we basically get red and green. And then I could put here T for time. And I, because all the color values need to be between zero and one, I can just take the fractional part of T and then we get this kind of uh, fading effect. So, but this is super simple. Uh, what's more interesting is, sorry, I'm with my zoom here. Um, uh, instead of directly running that code, I can also just look at the GLSL version so that compiler is actually written in fourth. So fourth compiles itself here, in this case, to GLSL. And this is what comes out. So here you can see we have those three variables which simulate the stack for this program. So if you have a more complicated program, you will get here more variables. And then here you have always the original fourth and the GL at the compiled version. So uh, this is how that looks. But I have some more examples here which are in more interesting. Um, just have to copy them to save time. So here there's now an increasing um, complexity. So here we basically, we can split this up so it's a bit more legible. So we take the x times 2 and then center it on screen. And at the end, we add, uh, so this is basically the red channel. This line is the green channel. And then the blue channel will be that last line. And that creates, for instance, this. So very beautiful in my eyes. Um, here's something which is actually my favorite one. I'm just using it now because we might not have much more time. Um, so let me just change this here. So this is basically a, a kind of recursive setup. So where we have a, uh, are you aware of the, or familiar with the Lissa shoes curves, like pendulum? So it's basically a kind of feedback equation where you take the, the current x input as the new y and the current y as the new x, and you basically get those kind of curves. So this is what we do here, but we only have one iteration. So if I type here more i's, so this is at the moment five i's, then we get different patterns, but you can see I have here new words. So instead of typing i five times, I can just write here i five, and it looks the same. But the more iterations I'm adding here, for instance, with 10 iterations, the more detail we get because those uh, curves kind of become more and more complex. So I'm struggling with my mouse pad here. So let's bump up the iteration to, for instance, here 30. And suddenly, we get something like this. In less than, the, like this is not even 200 characters, probably not even 100. Yeah, so that's pretty uh, amazing, in my opinion. And then here we can obviously take this further. We can like do 50, and then we get even more detail. So and you can play around with this forever. You know, like we can bump up here. For instance, if we take the amplitude down, we don't get anything. If we take the amplitude up, we get like 1950s wrapping paper. <laughs> marble effect, <laughs> or this 1930s. Um, here another quite uh, interesting one. So interesting for its shortness or pre brevity. So here a nice disco floor. <laughs> so and it's really interesting, like if you A, to learn about maths. So everything you see here is essentially just maths applied to basically colors. But uh, what I often do as well is to use, uh, if you use an OSX machine, to use Grafer to, for instance, type in those same formulas in here. So you, 
can basically type in this is your one sign, and then we have this whole thing. Let's put this in brackets. Ah, copy paste. And then we do the same thing again. And you do this, you can basically figure out already how certain behaviors um, work in there. Okay, so why do I choose fourth? So here I have to switch now. So in, in very quickly, so because it's super light, this entire JV uh, virtual machine and the wrapper is only 11 kilobytes zipped up. Uh, so it's nothing. Um, I have written an implementation which can run on those devices, and this is what we will get to next. It's pretty fast because especially if you implement it in C, you can compile directly to like machine code because it's such a simple, all operations are essentially just stack manipulations. And um, yeah, this kind of preempting now to the next section to, ah oh yeah, here this quote. If Lisp is the ultimate high level language, then Forv is the ultimate low level one. And I think this is completely true because it's not even a language, it's more of an interactive compiler. Um, so at the very end, just to give you a glimpse how this can be applied to audio, and it's really just a minute or less. Um, can we switch over? So there should be some sound playing. Yeah. So this is basically a 30 pound machine. It's a 200 megahertz processor, five point multi-touch uh, screen, has ethernet, SD cards and so on, a bit like a Raspberry Pi, but Raspberry Pis are usually more higher powered now, so this kind of a class in uh, lower. But I'm really interested in those low machines because I want to build interactive installations or for teaching. A, this platform is so constrained it actually makes teaching much easier than on a complicated um, operating system. And you can actually work directly with the hardware if, and if the thing breaks, you, it's easy to replace. Um, so here we have a very simple synthesizer. And it's all open source, so it can different filter uh, oscillator types. can do something like strings. Turn off the delay. But then we also can play the same thing, or not exactly now the same um, demo, but you can do not just those kind of tinny um, things, you can also do more beefy things. So here I can change, but there's almost no UI, it's everything, it's just come the keyboard presses. <laughs> but I can change the pitch interactively, and the entire program is like 15 kilobytes, including the synthesizer and the fourth. Um, there's another one uh, where you can do here examples, uh, VM and... So I can open this one up, so we can look at the source code. So this is looks quite complicated, but more than half of it is just comments, and you can basically program every aspect of that synthesizer, and you can do this while it's running. So um, I think I will leave you with that. So there, if you are interested, there is here my SoundCloud where I can find like over 40 different tracks. The source code is on GitHub for everything. Um, 
I also had a MIDI demo, but I'm overrunning already, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.